What's up guys and gals, welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today in the world of indie games, I've got a weird one for you. So you may recall this game, it's called Book of Travels. We played it about two years ago, and this game is kind of like a very, very lightweight, I mean, I wouldn't even call it an MMORPG. Really, I would call it an RPG that has some networking capability, effectively. But Book of Travels is a weird one. Uh, this is one of those games that I think is a very interesting challenge for anyone that does kind of what I do. That is to say, impressions, or reviews, or like previews. This is a very, very strange game, in the respect that there's truly nothing like it. Like, there is no other game out there that's quite like the Book of Travels. But the Book of Travels is an open world, sort of sandboxy RPG about a merchant traveling through just a giant landscape. You can actually take a look at the map right here. I'm currently just on this tile, but I mean, you're on this big old world right here, and you're a trader. That's the whole thing. Everybody in this game, yourself, other players, everyone is a merchant. Uh, and you kind of just make a character, and you cruise around, and you trade objects, and there is combat, and there are quests, and there are intrigues, and there are little conversations and things to be had. But ultimately, I would say that this is kind of like an anti-RPG, or almost like an anti-MMO. Uh, that's the best way that I know how to kind of, like, put it, and I don't mean that it's trying to destroy those other things. Instead, that it's trying to flip the genre on its head and do something completely new and unique. And so I've played the game for about 30 hours now, over the last two years since it came out in early access. I've played probably about 10 or 15 hours on release week. I probably played five or six hours, like, a year ago. And then I probably played, like, five or ten hours just kind of, like, preparing to do this video and sort of, like, gathering my thoughts about like what the game is and like what it's worth and like should you play it and honestly after all this time I'm still not completely and totally settled about that but for the next 30 minutes or so we're gonna play the game I'm gonna show you book of travels I'm gonna talk about the things that I like I'm gonna talk about the things that I don't like I'm gonna talk about sort of how I think the game trips over itself a little bit I think and then we're gonna decide whether or not it's a game for you but the game is currently in development as with most of these sort of online RPGs It'll probably be in perpetual development until the developers run out of money. I don't think that this game was ever going to be a top seller or like hugely popular or anything else like that. Right now it idles in very, very low player counts. You will occasionally come across somebody uh, playing the game along with you if you're like on a West Coast or like an East Coast time zone. I think I've come across two or three people since I came back to the game in the last couple of days, but very, very rare. Only around for a couple of minutes. But Book of Travels is an open-world merchant RPG uh, set in a strange, esoteric world where you are a foreigner, and you've arrived in these lands, and you've just got to kind of, like, figure out what's going on in order to make your fortune, make some money, figure out different intrigues, do quests, and honestly, there's not really a goal to this RPG. Uh, so, in general, RPGs are very, very focused on sort of, like, progression and goals, uh, getting new equipment, finding new quests, moving up to new raids, stuff like that. Uh, this game does have gearing, like you can see right here. I've got my backpack and I've got all my equipment. I've got, you know, a backpack, I've got, like, a choker, I've got a train worker's blanket, I've got a silk flower wreath, I've got a smelter's guard for my armor, I've got, like, kind of like a spear sword. I guess that I'm using for combat at the moment. The game does have combat. There is fighting. Uh, this culture that we are now immersing ourselves in as a foreigner uh, has a strong dueling culture, actually. Dueling is incredibly popular in this setting, and so people will frequently challenge you to duels, and you will have to duel them. Your character can die in the most recent patch they added, so when this game first came out, it was a permadeath game. If you died, you just died, and you had to kind of, like, make a new character. Your old character became, like, a ghost that could interact with the world in, like, interesting ways, but other than that, you kind of just, like, made a new guy. Uh, they've overhauled death at this point, and this patch is actually the first time they've added the new death into the game. I haven't done it yet because there's not a lot of combat in this game. Like, combat is not the focus, and yet combat is weirdly important because, like, a person that can't duel and defend themselves in this culture is, like, generally considered to be sort of, like, weak or, like, eyebrow-raising. Like, that's just general knowledge in this game's nebulous and setting is that everybody kind of, like, passively knows how to defend themselves. And so, anyway, hello there! Be a deer and help me find my husband. He is hiding somewhere around here close by. Is he? Oh, there's a loot spot right there. What is that? An Umber Lake Frog. Apparently, I can eat it. Uh, so, what am I doing right now in this game? Well, Book of Travels is really, really aimless. You need to understand that from the beginning of the game. 
if you think about, so I get the feeling that they had kind of like a meeting, the developers of this game, and they were like, so what are some of the fundamental attributes of being like an explorer or like a wanderer? And what they landed on with this game is actually fairly accurate. This game is kind of like uh, how, you know, old Victorians described war. It's a lot of boredom with panic on the in-between. Uh, basically, this is a game where you're going to spend a lot of time wandering around and exploring. And that's what I'm doing. I got a gift from a deer god. And the deer god told me I had to find, like, a, a deep dweller or something that's over here on this side of the island and give them the gift. And then the way of my path would be lit up for me. Uh, she said she would be singing. I hear the singing right now. Unfortunately, the game does not use enough occlusion. Uh, so a lot of the time you're going to be walking behind foliage and the, occlu the occlusion doesn't really kick in till too late. But uh, for right now, I'm looking for that deep lander. And I think the first thing that you're going to run into with this game is just how utterly gorgeous it is. Uh, this is a game that's like hand painted and looks really, really good. Visually, there is no other game quite like this one. I, this, this is a game of many, many uniques, and I think, hey, there's the deep lander. All right. I find it a chore to banter with strangers, but with you, I will gladly speak for a moment. You might have already noticed reagents in nature along your travels. Gathering them requires a keen eye and knowledge of where to search and patience. I can teach your eye to spot reagents needed for magical purposes. Magic brews and spell knots use many of the same reagents. Jade algae grows in streams and lakes, for instance, while dandelions can be found in sun-soaked meadows. Knots are not only used for the binding of spells, knots are also the traditional written form of the Velen language. Learning it can be costly, but I have know of a teacher that might help you for free. However, he is very strict. He has a house in the upper city. Look for a scholar wearing a yellow coat, and remember to greet him in the old fashion by sitting down, or he will most likely ignore you. I thought I was supposed to give, so I have like, I had a flower over here, the Temple Keeper's Blossom, and I thought I was supposed to give the flower to this person, but I guess I just need to have it in my inventory so that she'll talk to me. Once more, we meet Kaleem. Seashells can be found in lakes, streams, and on the shore. Alkin powder is close to townhouses. Driftwood dust can only be found on or near the open sea. The rare silk flower will only bloom in enchanted places. And by the by, have you visited the knot examiner in Bat Saha yet? You should learn how to read knots if you want to be able to study any type of lore, be it mystic or otherwise. All right, well, there you go. We have our next story thread. So for new characters in this game, one of the first things that you're going to be tasked with is learning to read. Uh, and I wanted to show this little chunk of the quest right here on purpose because this is kind of how the whole game functions. You will meet somebody on like a street corner or you will talk to an NPC that's sitting next to the ocean throwing rocks into the water. They will give you some vague esoteric reference to some guy you should go talk to. And in most video games, JRPGs, Western RPGs, you would just ignore that as flavor text. However, in this game, that's actually like a real thing. In all my 30 hours or so of playing the game, it has been my experience that whenever someone talks about a thing that's happening somewhere, it's a clue. That's a thread that you're supposed to pull on and you're supposed to write it down and go investigate. Now, in the initial copy of the game that we played two years ago, you couldn't write it down. You had to have a piece of paper on your desk to write it down. One of the new features of this game that they've added over the last couple years is that they have themselves... I forgot that I named this the suck -a Adventures. Anyways, they've added a journal to the game so you can keep track of like all these little threads that people will talk to you about. You can open and close this in dialogue without like interrupting it. And as you can see here, over the course of the last couple days, like prepping for this, I've just been kind of like scribbling down little notes about like people who have said something or like referred to something. Uh, this guy is the guy that's going to teach us how to read. And so we need to do a sit emote in front of him. And you need to understand that the entire game is kind of like this. Uh, there will be a reference to something. It will not be noted anywhere. If you think it's important, you need to write it down. You need to go investigate it. And then even then, you may have missed like a small detail about it. Like with this guy, I have to sit in front of him in order to talk to him. Well, what have we here? A stray Kaleem flying into my house. A well-mannered one at that. How nice. You must be here to learn to read the Velen writing. Am I right? That requires discipline, time, and love. Don't you know? Are you ready? Sitting comfortably? It'll be quite a lot to absorb in one sitting, so let us begin. Haradasam, Haradasam, Haradasim. Good, now for the rest. Garang, Garang, Garin. Desem, Deset, Disarem. Amka, Amkana, Armaga. Betel, Beltel, Belusi. 
opim, opam, opanim, vol, valo, valimo, so on and so forth. There, that should do it. Uh, let me give you my notes from your lesson. You will need to learn the skill from the lesson note in your inventory, then memorize the skill from your skill book. After that, you will have a grasp of Velen writing. Now fly away, little dandelion, and don't forget to read the sign on the way out to test your new skills. So in this culture, there is no written language. Strange. Well, there kind of is. So it's up in the air. But anyways, there is no written language that's used traditionally. Everything in this game is not works. So this culture that we're a part of, they tie ropes in different shapes to imply different phonetics and different ideas. Basically, almost like a, I don't know, almost like a pictograph, I guess. You have to learn how to interpret that as a foreigner, otherwise you're going to have a bad time. The reason I say there's kind of reading and writing is because they literally just gave me a book. Uh, that's obviously full of writing that teaches me how to read the Velen tongue with ropes or whatever. And so, like, eh. Uh, but there's, like, hundreds of these skills in the game. There's loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of them. Like, seriously, there are so many skills in this game. And most of them have, like, very niche uses. Uh, some of them are, like, passives that make you walk faster. Uh, some of them, like, make you better at trading or something like that. Like, basically, th there's a bunch of these. And collecting all of them is a big part of the game. Like, a, a high-level character will have lots and lots of skills that they can alternate between. And so we now have an instruction of the Velen Tongue. So there it is. We now know how to read. One of the first big things you need to do in this game. So now, when I walk past things, I should be able to read them. And so let's see if my guy does it here. He said there was a sign outside. I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be that right there, but it's not triggering. Well, we'll find a different sign. So this is my skill book right now. As of my current character, you do need to slot in some of this stuff, and basically knowledge points are what you get every time you level up. Leveling up in this game is not the focus, by the way. It's sort of like a byproduct of just wandering around and talking to people and trading things and resolving like random little intrigues and quests. Uh, as of right now, I'm level 4, almost level 5. Uh, my character's name is Shatbaya. I thought that was fun. It randomly generates your name. You don't get to pick your name in this game. It's got like a random, you just keep rolling. And when Shat Baya came up, I, I died laughing. And then I just made it my name. Because like, when Shat Baya comes up in a random name generator, you just made yourself a completely unique entity inside this game universe. All right? Shat Baya doesn't care. Shat Baya is a gangster of the merchant world. Uh, but you've got a number of different stats here. So, for example, at the beginning of the game, you'll take different RimWorld-style perks, positives, and negatives. Uh, everybody in the game has four talents. The four talents that resolve everything in the game are sociality, physicality, spirituality, and mechanics. Uh, right now, I'm pretty good at three out of four of those with my current gear set. You can equip different gear, though, and it'll give you buffs to different stats so that everybody can do everything. It just depends how much crap you want to carry around with you in your backpack, and that limits the amount that you can carry for trading. Uh, my character has blue eyes. I don't know why that matters. It made me pick it. I'm from a small town. I was born under an eastern wind. There's a lot of esotericism in this game. I absolutely 100% believe all this stuff matters in some way because nothing in this game is kind of like unintentional. But you may never... This, this is the weird sort of RPG where you may never ever figure out what having blue eyes does or why it matters. That's the, you might never figure it out. You might never find that storyline thread. Uh, but anyways, down to the bottom, you've got your fighting stats. Uh, you've got force. That's how hard you hit. Ward is basically how much HP you have in combat. Uh, you have speed. This is basically your guard. When it breaks, you lose, and it means they ran you through. Uh, we've got our speed. It determines how fast you attack. And then we've got your burden. And so burden uh, is subtracted from speed. So we actually have a minus three speed. Uh, which means we're a little bit slower than most people when we fight. But we do have extra armor and things like that. There are survival mechanics to the game as well. I don't know, like, how much they matter. Like, they sort of matter. And so it's probably a good idea. We have a red meter and we have a white meter at the top of the screen. The red meter is your energy. When it goes down, you've got to kind of, like, sit and rest for a little bit. On top of that, you also need to eat food. So here's my backpack with all my different slots. Uh, we can go ahead and eat that frog, I guess. There you go. I ate an umber frog. Oh, no, dude. Unfortunately, I've now given myself uh, 600 seconds of nausea. Something stirs deep in your gut. You might just retch or be doomed to carry this unease for a while. So I have no doubt in my mind that this right here, if you go talk to some NPC 
while you have this on you. There is an NPC somewhere in the world that rewards you with a quest or an item if you go and find them while you're nauseous. I guarantee it. There's some guy in the world that talks about like there's a proper etiquette to eating frogs or something like that. It's a, it's a lost taste or something like that. And then if you remember that tiny snippet that you accidentally came across and like you eat a frog in front of him and then talk to him with this debuff, I bet you there's a guy out there because that's how this game works. It's all, it's all just things that you would never ever think of. It's, it's the strangest thing ever where like this game is effectively one giant deduction mosaic where like you just listen to things people say and the tiniest interactions like being nauseous can trigger a quest with some guy halfway across the world. Like, you, you never quite know. Does this guy want to talk to me? What do you want to talk about? Oh, it's a different person. Oh, they're trading. That's a player right there. Oh, we got to see a player. That's cool. It's pretty rare that you see a player in this game, so that player is trading right there. I didn't even realize that was a player, so there you go. Uh, it's Naro, and so Naro has now been met by Shatbaya. Unfortunately, due to my frog-related poisoning, my character can't really, like, run or, like, move around effectively right now. So, I'm gonna wait until this buff falls off in, like, seven minutes, and we'll, we'll see what happens there. Oh, look, I found a bunch of knots on the ground. Very cool. Uh, a big chunk of this game is just gonna be you walking around picking things up off the ground. I don't want to like, so there's a lot of traveling in this game, and this game is distinctively inconvenient. It's inconvenient on purpose, because they want you to slow down and understand that like everything happens at its own pace. Now, if you're anything like me, you're like, forget that, I want to advance right now. I get it, so there's a certain level of incompatibility with this game and me as a player right there. But you will notice that everything in this game sends you like halfway across the map. You know, somebody will be like, I need you to deliver a message to this guy across the entire game map. Uh, most of the things you'll find in this game, they want you to travel a bit because the walking and picking stuff up off the ground is actually kind of like a core part of your character's development. Uh, it also puts you in a situation where you're traveling through the world at different days and different times. This game functions on a real-life clock, which means that the day-night cycle is synced up with the real world. Like, day in this game is literally as long as day in real life, and night is quite literally as long as night in real life. Everything in this game also happens on a time scale. So another thing here that you need to be aware of is that everything in this game can happen at a certain place at a certain time, which means there are events that only happen at like 3 in the morning on a Friday. This is a feature that I think they really, really, really need to lean back on. Uh, I, I think actually every single day in-game should be three days. So I think every four hours there should be a day cycle, then four hours of night, then four hours of day, then four hours of night. So, like, each event repeats a couple times a day. Uh, because as of right now, if you have, like, a life and, like, a job and, like, you know, responsibilities and things like that, there are just certain events you will never see in this game because they happen at, like, 5 in the morning on a Thursday or something like that. Uh, but the reason they want you to wander around the world is because you'll find stuff like this. Uh, so this is a challenge right here. My character is good at mechanics, so we can look at this interlocking pile of parts, and we can solve this challenge with our mechanics skill. Similarly, there are also physicality skills, there are social skills. Uh, these are also used in quests and in narratives. A small tomback mirror. When polished to a shine, the hand mirror reflects the visage of the owner, enabling them to groom themselves and look as presentable as possible. It's a good quality offhand that gives us plus one to sociality, but gives us plus two to burden. That's okay. Uh, I don't really have a whole lot of stuff that makes my sociality better. What does this clay jar do? This clay jar was clearly made with love, perhaps handcrafted by a traveler on the road. It is easy to see them set up a camp by a stream, finding a beautiful bounty of clay in the riverbed. Okay, so they made a clay jar. You hold it in your offhand, and it gives you three more inventory slots. Gotcha. Now that I can read, I can read these knots. I've been finding these, and every single one of them, it says I can't read them. We demand the truth of what happened in Casa. Expose the underhandedness of the corrupt council. The Sephra sometimes offer the words of the Varheem. Their minds were set on short-time goals, a culture devoid of foresight. Please circulate. Learner's Union and Children's Union seasonal congression on schooling will take place in CASA next season. Okay. And then, of course, I've got, like, thankful knots and other stuff inside of here. Now that my frog-related poisoning is over, I can show you what combat looks like, too. Hey, you there! What? What do you want? 
Come back when you're overburdened with riches, Kaleem, and I will offer you skills that will prove priceless to a warrior. I invite you now and teach you for free a lesson of defeat. Draw your sword and let instruction begin. So this is what combat looks like. Uh, you're going to draw your blade, and as you can see, I've drawn on this guy. We have different amounts of force and ward. Uh, what that means is that I can attack right there, and my force is applied to his ward. And then every time I smack him, we kind of need to... Let's go for that right there. Oh, we both hit each other. I think I probably lose this one. Let's go right there. There's a big hit. Oh, and then he got me right there. We almost got him. But basically what you just saw right there is that you have a little meter. It fills up from 0 to 100%. When it reaches 100%, you auto-fire your attack. You will hit them with 100% accuracy. They lose as much ward as you have power. From there... What is that dog doing? I've never seen that dog. He's got something in his mouth, I think. Anyways, your power is deducted from their ward. The person who runs out of ward first loses. Uh, so it's kind of like a fun little mini game of like deciding what's worth it and what isn't worth it. And so you gotta decide whether or not, you know, against a stronger opponent, it might be a better idea to fire off a flurry of 60% attacks in the hopes that you'll get more hits off and it'll delay his turn. Uh, if you're way more skilled than your opponent, you can kind of wait for those guaranteed hits. And so it's kind of an interesting, it's an interesting combat system. It's not ever present, but there is a bit of combat in this game. I'll run it back one more time so that you can see what it looks like. We'll draw again, there we go. All right, initiative is determined. We're gonna fire that thing. There you go, nice little hit up off it. Oh, we dodged, nice. Hit him with that one right there. Oh, there's another hit. Okay, okay, okay. We've been hit, all right. We'll hit him back with a big dodge right there. We got hit again. Okay, we've been staggered. Oh, he's firing early, my man wants it. Oh. Did we lose again? I think we lost again. There's a little bit of netcode to the game as well. The performance is much increased from the last time I played around with it, but there is still netcode from time to time that will get in the way with like lag of combat and whatnot. One of the downsides to the game being forced. Honestly, I think this would be a much better game if they had made it single player. But I feel that way about most multiplayer games. But that's what combat looks like right there. That's low stakes combat. That's just you fighting against like a village guard, basically. But there are bandits. There are like wolves. There are like things out there in the world that want to hurt you. And they want to destroy you and eat you. I'll eat the potted cherries this time. That feels like it might be a little bit more palatable to my character. Uh, then, oh yeah, the server's lagging right now. There we go. It's weird. Like, uh, I guess it's one of those Murphy's Law things, but I've been playing the game for a day or two now, prior to the recording of this video, just to get reacclimated. And I've thought that the performance had been much increased. I don't think I've really had any issues or problems or anything else like that. When the game first came out, it was crazy laggy, like gnarly laggy to the point that it was almost unplayable. And so they've mostly fixed that, but of course, once I start recording, lag will flare up and make me look like a fool. And so anyways, normally the lag is not an issue, but it does come up from time to time. Oh yeah, dude, there's another person right there. Uh, hi, hey, what's up? You can only communicate through emotes. Uh, there's not really a whole lot of stuff other than emotes to communicate through. That character's obviously probably much higher level than mine. Uh, there are shops, as I mentioned, this is a game about being a merchant and trading things. Uh, there are shops just about everywhere. All the best stuff in the game is bought, in fact. But that's actually kind of like a good thing, because the only way for you to make money in this game, there is no currency, there's only bartering. Uh, the only way for you to make, I guess, profit or increase your net worth by having lots of objects that are awesome uh, is by traveling around and finding them on the ground or doing quests or doing events and stuff like that. And so once you have those things, you can come to places like right here. Uh, this guy's an armor vendor, so he's got like a helmet right here. It gives us a bit more ward, uh, but it burdens us. We've got a metal top cap. We've got protective masks. We've got a chest plate right here, which is roughly the same as what I'm currently wearing. Uh, everything in this game is going to be a balance between like how heavy do you want to be versus like how frequently do you want to attack versus how much damage can you tank everything is kind of like a tightrope walk in between those two points that's it and so that's an armor shop right there uh, you gain xp in this game by doing anything and everything once again this game is totally built around the idea of like wanderlust 
uh, which means that you don't XP by like fighting goblins over and over and over again. In this game, you get XP from conversations with people around town. You get XP from having like a well-orchestrated trade where you got more value out than you put in. Uh, you get XP by doing those challenges like that metal thing that I showed you over to the left that we untangled and got that mirror from. Uh, you get XP for just about everything. And then all that that XP does is that it increases the amount of knowledge points that you have for active skills, basically. Active and passive skills. So right now I have seven or eight passive skills slotted in. You can see what they cost in learning points underneath the card right here. There are loads of these. I can't exp there, There's a ton. There's like a gajillion magic spells. They all do very specific things. There's a million different cooking recipes for tea. Uh, that give you different buffs and things. There, there's all kinds of stuff. There's things like this right here. Tricks of the Messenger makes me walk and run faster when I'm on a road. Um, armor proficiency means that I can wear armor, you know. What does this guy have to say? There's a thousand ways to get rich in Bat Saha, as the saying goes, Kaleem. No way someone fresh off the boat like you can see all the angles. Wait, hold on. How are you making out on the streets? We'll be keeping an eye on you. Whistle if you need another pointer. And sometimes dialogue boxes close too fast in this game. Uh, it's happened a number of times. Usually they stay open forever, but I think sometimes a weird quirk of the server makes it so that, like, they close early and then you miss out on the dialogue, which is particularly unfortunate because this game is very, very heavily about dialogue. And we got four players in the same spot. I haven't seen that since I came back. Well, there you go. Apparently it's not having that big of population issues. That's good. Like, I was about to bring that up in the video, too, and just be like, you know, I haven't really seen any other people the entire time I've been playing. But, like, I, I'm off work at night, so I'm always playing at night in this game. And I don't think very many people play at night because there's not a whole lot of stuff going on at night in this game. So Book of Travels is going to be a banality simulator in summation. Like, this game is kind of akin to something like Viscera Cleanup Detail where it's a game that due to the esoteric nature of its gameplay, like the arcane nature of the gameplay, it's going to be exceptionally easy for you to miss the forest for the trees in this game. Uh, this is a game of deduction. It's an RPG about deduction, paying attention to detail. It's an RPG about boring walks and boring journeys across landscapes that you've already seen, past quests that you've already resolved and things that you've seen uh, to finish up the one that you're currently working on right now. And when you get there... The quest receiver might not even be there because it's on, like, the wrong day, you know what I mean? And you just didn't show up on the right day or at the right time. Like, the magic in this game tends to happen with random events that can occur on the road to populate that travel downtime with interesting things and people to interact with. The problem with that is that so many in the things in the game are kind of linked to realistic time cycles or specific interactions that I think your average player is really likely to miss many of the more interesting things that can happen in the game world before shrugging and saying that the game is boring and empty and turning it off. Like, this is an anti-RPG. That's what I've been calling it. This has heavy old-school leanings. I mean, if you come into Book of Travels expecting to have Skinner Box MMORPG-style mechanics and systems to be in play that are structured you're gonna have a bad time this is not the game for you like this is a game where a big chunk of your time is gonna be spent doing mundane stuff because once again this entire game loops back to that idea of the journey being more important than the destination and so i've found that this game is the most enjoyable when i kind of have like you know a mixed drink so i have like a margarita i'm halfway through it i play the game for like one to two hours you know, with a little spliff, and then I shelf it for a day or two before I go again. It's a, it's a good coffee game, I guess. Uh, it's not a game where long sessions are going to feel super satisfying or productive. In fact, I found that almost universally long sessions in this game feel boring as hell. Uh, however, if you have an eye for detail and you're good at taking notes and you want a slower paced RPG that I think very accurately simulates what it might be like to be a foreign trader in a foreign land where you understand nothing and you have to figure it out as you go, this game hits that nail on the head. This, I think, is a very specific game for a very specific niche gamer. And I would actually argue that Book of Travels needs a free-to-play version for demoing purposes, like a limited free-to-play version, uh, more than just about any game I have ever seen on Steam. Um, it, it's a game that really begs for negative reviews for people that don't know exactly what they're getting into. And so, like, being able to demo this game, especially at its high price point, would be 
a really, really good thing and I think would actually eliminate a lot of negative reviews. Uh, it's a beautiful, complex, arcane. This is an abstruse experience, all right? I don't get to use that word very often, but it's abstruse. Uh, it's going to instantly turn off a large chunk of players with its lack of action, uh, its non-existent hand-holding, quest givers, giant floating exclamation points. This is a game where if you don't pay attention to every little thing that every little NPC says, and you don't kind of like passively keep notes, and you don't let your ears prick up a little bit when you hear certain terms and whatnot, you're actually really unlikely to hit any of the major plot points or interesting quests, which can be really easy to miss even if you are detail-oriented. Like, in that way, I feel like Book of Travels is an incredibly difficult, if not impossible, game to flatly make a recommendation on, to be like, yes, I recommend this game. It's kind of a leap of faith game, and you don't know, like, if you're the person this game is going to speak to until you actually play it. For me, I'm kind of like middle of the road. There are times I really like this game, and then there are other times where I'm just bored out of my mind and I can't wait to play something else. So I do, and I think that's the best way to enjoy the game. Um, if it seems like the kind of weird quiet experience that you think you'll be into you can go for it there's hundreds of hours of gameplay here but a large chunk of those hundreds of hours of gameplay are going to be you walking around like waiting for the next quest trigger thing to happen you know uh, in short bursts i like the game a lot however it can get boring walking around a lot of the time just picking things up off the ground and developing your financial health and so book of travels i think is sort of cursed to always be sort of this really unique game that I definitely think someone is going to play this and someone is going to iterate on this and like like some of the ideas and they're going to refine it and they're probably going to make something really, really big one day and they're going to reference this game as being the inspiration for that big thing. It strikes me as being that sort of game where it's not necessarily going to be hugely appreciated or understood by right now people. It is going to be one of those things that with a little refinement and definement down the road, someone else is going to be like, oh yeah, I played this game a long time ago called Book of Travels, you know, and it was the major inspiration on my now multi-million selling game. Uh, but it's always going to be a niche game, like period. This is a really, really niche title. Uh, when the lag isn't acting up, I think the game is great. It's one of those unique novel titles that I really want to throw my weight behind supporting. Uh, when the game is laggy, or when I can't find any stuff to do, and I just can't find the next quest thread or interesting thing to investigate, it's one of those games that I found really easy to shrug and turn off for a couple weeks and forget about. What happens to you is going to be probably somewhere in between those points. Uh, my name is Splattercat. I sift through the pile to find what's worthwhile in the world of indie games every single day so you don't have to. Today up on the chopping block, we had Book of Travels. Two years in, uh, there have not been a ton of updates to this game, but it seems like they're finally getting to content after unrolling the back end it seems like they're starting to release things that are actually content related so that should be another warning once again very slow development on this one like i'm pretty sure the developers like overstretch themselves on this one <laughs> uh, but anyways i will see you all later thank you for stopping on in take care and that's all i got folks bye bye